good. Thanks everybody for showing up. <laughs> uh, yeah, first, uh, here's the agenda. If you want to, I'd like to, first of all, thanks our sponsors. Um, we, we, we've we lost a sponsor. Apparently we don't have enough people, I think, showing up. So just thanks to GoBridge this time. <laughs> um, all right, then the talk is going to be about modules, the Athens project and beyond. Uh, first, I'll explain a little bit about what modules are. I guess most of you know already, so it's not going to go into too much detail there. Then about the Athens project, and then about some um, <coughs> new things in, in Go that use or maybe even replace the Athens project uh, coming up. <coughs> first of all, yeah, what are modules? It's basically just a collection of Go packages that have a version and have to use semantic versioning. That's very important. You have to really uh, if you use a, if you create a new version, a new smaller version, it has to be compatible with the old one, else it doesn't really work in Go. It's one of the things that people are a bit worried about, about Go modules. That, uh, we probably, people need to have a bit more discipline than, than usual. Uh, so and that basically the, the Go modules specify what code is in a build then, because they have a version, so you can use it for that. Uh, if you want to, uh, I've got a link here, you might want to look at that later on, which shows you how to set up modules and going through a whole worked example, which I'm, I wasn't going to go through here at the moment. Uh, Go modules are basically specified by go.mod file, which is a file in the root of your Go project. And it specifies the, the name of the module and then all the modules that are included or used inside of uh, your module. Can be updated by hand or by tools, a lot of times by tools. Uh, if you just to create one, it's very simple. You just go to, let's say you start a new project, you go to a new directory, just type go mod in it, and then the name of your module, which you usually do with a, like, um, just like a URL style kind of package name. Uh, so, uh, most people use GitHub there. The uh, nice thing about Go modules is that they can read existing package managers. I saw a talk uh, from people from JFrog and they said I think that there were 19 different package man existing package managers that are, that are supported. That sort of explains the problem we have in the Go ecosystem in a sense. Just the fact that you have 19 dependency uh, managers. <coughs> I have only ever heard of those three. Yeah, this thing, but apparently there are a lot more. <laughs> Didn't know either. So this is an example of a new um, uh, Go mod. Uh, first line just shows you the name of the file, basically the import part that you have to use if, if you use this somewhere else. And then the require part is the list of the modules it uses and their version. Uh, this is a bit of a synth uh, synthetic one. It's not a real one. I just made that up in a sense. So I'll show you a, a, a real one later on. In fact, I'll show you that one now. Now I'm looking at, this is the go.mod from the Athens project itself. So this is the, the name. Uh, one thing you'll see there is not everything uses modules yet. So a lot of uh, the version numbers like these ones are basically synthetic ones. So the version is set to zero. It has a date, uh, a timestamp when the module was downloaded and then the hash commit. So go module. If, if the module itself doesn't use uh, versions yet, and versions are just tags basically in Git. They have to be have a specific format. It just has to be a V and then three numbers uh, separated by a dot. But if it, if it doesn't support them, then it can use these uh, synthetic versions, basically. Uh, it also records dependencies of dependencies. That's why you get the indirect uh, comment in there that says that this, I added this for this, uh, for example, I added AWS SDK and that requires this Negroni thing. I, I don't know if that's the case or not, but that's basically, that's how this works. Incompatible. I've not seen that before. Uh, I, yeah, I read that. That is when, oh, what was that again? It's when the 
the module already had tags before them. Uh, sorry, the, that project already had tags, or that repo oh. already had tags before they moved to Go. Okay. So Beska says these are tags, but they're not really compatible to okay. to Go module. So you have to treat them. I can be a bit careful there. Okay. Or not. <coughs> I believe they're fix they're changing things with this as well. And oh, everything that is versioned greater than one on that list there is incompatible. Oh, it could be yeah. Yeah, wouldn't yeah. Modules of well, this one isn't, for example. That's one. Yeah, <laughs> and, and this one. Yeah, most most projects if they're existing. Uh, they will be older and they, they will have used versions before modules came along. So that's, that's just a situation we're going to have to live with for a while. Right. Okay, go back now. So, uh, how do you add modules? A lot of times you can just do go build dot or in your IDE. Usually, your IDE will save, uh, uh, will automatically call go build when you when you save and if you've used a module somewhere it will automatically get them you can also add them by hand by doing a go get if there are problems uh, it's useful to do go get minus v or even better go get minus vx that will tell you way too much information about how it tried to get the, mo the module so you can occasionally find out if there was an issue with, with a version number uh, there's also uh, a way you can update your existing modules, which at the moment is called is go get minus u. This will change in version 1.13 in that in the minus u will mean only for the current package, the one you're in. Update those dependencies, or so if you got multiple packages, only for that one. And there will be a go go get minus m minus all or something like that, I believe which will then do it for the whole project. At the moment, go get minus u updates all dependencies for the whole project, which is something you might not want to do, right? Let's say if you use a dependency only in one package of your of your module, sometimes you just want to update those ones, and that's what go get minus u will do from 1.13. Uh, so it's not the minus m minus all because that's something as the minus u all. So uh, I believe that it will be in 1.13. Here are some useful commands you can do. Go list minus m will tell you the the main module, which can be useful in, in CI scripts if you use that one. Go list minus m all will get the list of all the modules that are used. Which again, it's useful in CI scripts. And a lot of CI scripts you want to record what were all your dependencies when you're, when you're doing a build. Store that somewhere. Uh, also, whenever you add a module, it doesn't get automatically, uh, it only gets added. It, that doesn't remove any, an older version of the same package or multiple older versions that could be there. So what you would use for that is the go mod tidy command. That will basically go over all your dependencies again, get the highest compatible version for those packages and then removes the, the, old, uh, the other ones from your go.mod file, it's, it's, it's definitely useful to do that regularly. Um, another one which I'll actually show in, in um, uh, later on in, in the demo is go clean dash mod cache. Uh, your modules by default, after, the, after they've first been downloaded, they get stored in, on your system as well so that you have a cache locally. And that is in your uh, by default in your go part package mod directory and in there is then a download directory where they are and sometimes you want to clean those out just to start again and that's what this this does <coughs> and uh, additionally most of the commands also have a dash dash mod read only option that you can use and that basically says that uh, for example if you're building do not change anything in the existing go.mod and if they do it's an error basically so that's something you would use in a ci step where you want to make sure that uh, your go.mod is correct against the code you're using Just make so this will can throw an error if, if that's not the case because then something has changed which you weren't aware of okay so that's probably if you're 
if you do a go, so go build would add missing modules by default. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And if you check that in, that will that then fail? Yes, yeah, it does. Yeah, build is not allowed to go. Yeah, so it will fail. Okay. Telling you so it's for CI stuff. That's yeah, good. Very useful. To, yeah. All right. Additionally, there's a go dot sum file which basically just specifies all the checksum of all the modules. Uh, that's so you can be sure that yeah, your, your modules haven't changed in between, right? There's somebody on, uh, where they store them on the internet that they haven't added in a new version and uh, uh, yeah, try to sneak something in <laughs> most of the time. Uh, this should also be a version control. Uh, I'll talk about that a bit later on because there, there is in the new uh, 1.13, there are some changes there and uh, you can actually verify at the moment, you can, this will only check what you have currently compared to what is on the internet. It, it will not vouch for that the first time you downloaded it that that was the correct one. And they've added something to do that, later, uh, which I'll show later on. Okay, let me just show you the, the code that's on file. See, that looks like this. So you basically have two lines for every entry. And they have, uh, yeah, uh, hashes basically for each module. Uh, now, we're, uh, because we're using semantic versioning, the modules you download from the internet are supposed to be immutable so that they don't change anymore after they've been released so you can you should be able to cache them locally as well so you don't have to download them from the internet and that's what project atoms does it's it's not the only module proxy uh, but it is one that, that microsoft built and that is uh, at the moment is is gaining some traction quite a lot of people seem to use it it's it's set up at the moment so it's still in beta but it's it's good enough to use either on your local computer or within the company. It's not yet ready for full internet scale kind of thingies. And to be honest, we might not even need that given, which I'll talk about later on. Uh, yeah, so some of the benefits there are, yeah, of course, you, and I'll, I'll do a demo about that. Download performance should be better because you're not downloading the full, uh, you're not doing, going over the whole Git history and, and talking to Git protocol, you can just do a normal download, which I'll have more details about later on. Uh, nice thing is you'll always have local copies of your modules. Let's say something disappears on the internet. If it's in, in this cache, you'll, you'll still have it, so you, you can keep on building. And you can add some, some extra logic there. Because, uh, so this is the way it works. If, if the module you're asking for, which here is just uh, module M, for example, is if it's not there, uh, your go get will talk to the proxy, uh, which will say, which will then say, yeah, I, I don't have this module. Let me talk to the actual version control system for things like GitHub or GitLab. Uh, we'll get the module, store it locally, and then return it to you. And then when it's cached, you basically only ever talk to the proxy. You don't go out into the version control system or at one point there was talk of a thing called a registry as well, which I don't think Microsoft is building anymore. That's going to be done. Uh, the registry is basically like a proxy, but on internet scale. And I think Google is, is providing that one now. Who? Google is, is going to provide one. All right. Uh, and the way you set up uh, this, uh, the way you tell your, your local Go installation to use Atoms is by setting this uh, Go proxy environment variable. It either has a URL of the local proxy server. Uh, you can actually also use file system because it's smart enough to know that. So if you just say file and then a path, it can use your local uh, a local disk. But give, given that your Go uh, installation will already cache your uh, modules in your Go path package vault, so really no need to use that, but it, it does work. Um, sorry. And then there are uh, two other options. One of them is off. In that case, if it tries to download something from the internet, it actually complains, it fails. That's, I think, another one you can use, for example, in, in CI, where you can say, yeah, uh, you've got everything local, or 
uh, yeah, yeah. Or if you if you use vendoring, for example, you can still use vendoring with modules. You can say uh, there's a go mod vendor command which will create a vendor directory and then put all the modules that you use in there. And if you then check that into source control, then you shouldn't have to use the internet anymore. So some industries like to keep all their source code under under wraps, right? So they could use this the off option there because that will fail if it tries to download something. And then another one, uh, which is uh, if it's not set, so the default value or the empty string or the string direct, then it goes always goes to the, the version control system, which is yeah, GitHub. The protocol itself is, is very simple. This is actually all the calls you get in the protocol. So first of all, you get a list of all the the versions for a given module. So you give a module as, as part of the the URL there in the first one here. Uh, and then you can get information about a specific version. Does the at be a literal? Sorry? Does the at be in the URL, is that a literal? Yeah, yeah, that's the way it is, yeah. Okay. I, think, I think it's just to specify the end of your package. There might be oh, a package that has a list or something in the name, uh, you know, linked list or linked <coughs> slash list, yeah. something like that. Uh, and then, yeah, the most used is the last one there, or that's the one that, that gives the, the most benefit. That basically gives you a, the version as a zip file, as a zip archive. So that's where the speed up is, is coming from. So that instead of having to do a git checkout, which is basically what go get does, it can just get everything in there just as one uh, zip file, basically. Right. So uh, this is a sample one. If you use package errors, which are well-known package uh, for, for uh, handling errors and annotating errors. So th that's the way go get under the hood. It, it would do these, these calls basically. First it gets the list of them. Then you um, probably takes the last one there, the latest one, 0 0.8, get some information about it. And then it downloads the actual uh, zip file. It's a very simple protocol, this one, but that's, that's usually a good thing. <laughs> All right, uh, let me show you a little demo now, and this is where I have to do a little dance to the demo gods to make sure this works. This, uh, yeah, or, um, I'm also using, uh, I've got numbers later on, uh, which I've done in a more stable environment. <laughs> so that way, this is all on Wi Fi, so I'm not 100% sure it's going to work, but it should. Uh, basically, let me show you here, my package directory, it doesn't have a mod directory, so there's no local um, modules cached. Uh, this here is a checkout of the, uh, the Atoms source code itself. I've made one change and then I added this target here, build mod, which uh, I'm going to use just to do a go mod download, to download all, all its dependencies. And I've added a, a time, and the first one is going to be direct, so that just goes straight to the version control system. Uh, so let me just run that one. As you can see, this is now going uh, out onto the internet to each of these GitHub pages or, or then git.apache.org pages and whatnot, downloading the modules, installing them locally. And of course, the idea is that this one will take some time and the other one is supposed to be quicker. <laughs> I'm just stalling for time here while it downloads, basically. Um. It's almost Node.js and it's downloading the internet. Yeah, yeah so much. To, to be honest, the, the, the problem that they had there with Node.js with the was left pad or, or whatever it's called, mm -hmm. that's why they were thinking about modules. <laughs> In, in, in Go after after the problems that caused when one small module was deleted and pretty much nothing worked anymore in Node.js. Uh, go bin go bin data. There was one where you 
they deleted it and then somebody else came and created the exact same yeah. one with the same name. Mm. Luckily, they were doing it for the good of mankind, yeah. that anybody could have put whatever they liked in this before the sums. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's the called Go Bin Data, which was like a, a tool that would you, you could specify like some uh, HTML files or something like that, and it would put them, oh, it would process them, put them into as, as, as source code files in, mm -hmm. so, so you could have still one static binary. So, okay, so this was 80, uh, 82 seconds. Uh, let me show you in the directory now. We have the mod directory. And there it has this like this git apache.org. So the, these are all subdirectories with all, all our code. Let me clear that up first. Uh, this error is just I think because I'm in the same directory. It's, see the mod directory doesn't exist anymore. It's no longer package. Um, I've got Athens already running here. I'll show you how to do that later on. Uh, and the Athens itself has a storage directory, which at the moment is empty. So I'll run Athens first uh, using the Athens proxy. That should take a while before, because it still has to fill in the cache. It should actually be slower than, than the direct one. But then if you run it again after that one, that should be quicker. Uh, famous last words. Have you volume mapped in that in storage? Yeah, 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 it is, yeah, yeah, that's part of the thing. Yeah. All right, cool. All right, so now for the same command, I'm just gonna use, ooh, actually, sorry, I made a mistake here. Shouldn't use this one. Uh, or this is where my preparation falls down. I need to get my IP address. <laughs> I think it's this one. <coughs> so basically what I'm doing here is I'm just setting the Go proxy environment variable to be my local machine at port 3000, which is where Athens is running. Uh, I think I'm just going to make it HTTP because I don't have TLS set up for this Athens instance. And now let's see if that runs again. I fully expect the first one to take longer because it, it has to actually go to the version control system and then store them locally as well on, on disk, so that should take a while. Uh, While it does its thinking, I just ask, how does it interact with um, private Git repositories? Uh, you, um, we use GitLab here at Speechmatics, and you can, in Athens itself, you can add a netrc file uh, which would contain, which can contain like your login and then a token or a password, but it's basically a token. And in GitLab that works. So you can create your own token for your user, and then uh, you you map in your volume mount that the directory where you've got your netrc, uh, and then you set an environment variable when you run Athens saying this is the directory which I volume mounted it and it then copies it into the right place to use. So that should work. Uh, took me a few tries to get that right, I have to admit, but it does work. <laughs> and I haven't tried with GitHub, but I assume it's the same there, or at least very similar. And in the documentation they do explain this, so it, it's, it's not a... The only problem is a bit, and that's one of the remarks I make later on, so yeah, it's a, it's a bit clunky in that you can only have it for one user, right? Uh, ideally, you want to run an Athens server for like your whole team or so that your CI scripts can access it as well because those are the ones that start from a clean environment and that would have the, the most benefit of using a cache. So but then for those, you would have to set 
yeah, at the moment there's no crate. You can basically only set one token in a sense. So you would either have to share a token and a user for everybody, or. Yeah. But you end, you end up, for most CI systems, you end up doing that pretty much anyway. For when it does its build, it just uses a token to get. To the yeah, just, yeah, yeah. But it's uh, like, for example, in GitLab, that token is only available when it's running inside of the CI. You cannot use that same token from the outside. See what I mean? It, it has like a default value for that environment variable. I, th I think what I've done without a proxy is the CI server has an SSH key, which and that SSH okay. key has root access to the private repos. Yeah, could do some. Yeah, but then that means you have to copy your SSH keys into Athens, which yeah, I don't know. You want to do that? <laughs> this, this is all this. You can see here. This is finished. This set is 145, which is yeah, more. Uh, if you look in the Atom storage directory that now has those files and if you look in the package directory also it again has a mod directory which should have those yeah exactly the same ones which is quite nice didn't plan them now <laughs> uh, let me now clear it's out it's got a version on the end of it in your user one. Oh, yeah okay. so there is a difference yeah yeah, but, yeah. Maybe, did you already have that or did you clean that out? I, I cleaned it out before, yeah, because I showed that the directory yeah. wasn't there, so. Maybe it just saves it differently. Okay. Uh, now, Athens is built by Microsoft and not by Google, right? So it uh, probably uses something different. Although I believe Athens does use just calls go get under the hood anyway. Because when you run it as a Docker image that has the that's based on the, the official Golang image. Mm -hmm. They just run it in there. Somebody might have actually put in an import on that string with an at sign in it. Could be. Yeah. Is that viable? Is that plausible? I don't know. No, no. That's a good question. The basic imports, like when you import from, it's just a string, which yeah. is just a folder on a disk. Yeah. Um, do you know? Or maybe, it, anyway, okay. And I think you only specify the, the import at the version, you specify that inside of your Go mod file, right? And, and if you have it as an import path, then it's usually, uh, it will be like go.opensensors.io slash v. Uh, so, uh, yeah. You wouldn't have it for 0 0.17 because that wouldn't have any slash v on it. If it was v1.0, then should, or v, uh, v2.0, then it would be slash v2 as import part. Anyway, I'm now cleaning out the mod cache again. So the the copies are still inside of Athens, but no longer in the local Go uh, environment because that's where it looks first. Uh, see if anything is there. It's not there. And this should be quicker now. I'm touching as much wood as I can find. But as you can see, that went a lot quicker. This will download it from the local, uh, from uh, Project Athens, basically. So that's 10 seconds. It's a big, big advantage. Okay. So now, uh, Athens itself has some configuration options as well. One thing you could do, for example, is override the caching. You could say, do not store certain modules here. And you can have a plus and a minus to say, do not store the... F I'll show you the example later on. And uh, another thing you can also do is, do not store it here, but always go to the upstream proxy. So if you have a, a separate proxy running that, um, which, which I'll show later on, the, the, the one that Google has set up now. You can say, never store this copy locally, just get it from there, because you, know, you don't want to store. Let's say, let's say you don't have enough storage space for the Athens server, you, you want to exclude certain ones, which you can always download if they're in a valley. Um. <coughs> Sorry, this is the config file. Uh, uh, what this does here, for example, is it, it excludes the Azure one, except for the Azure SDK for Go. So you, you can do it that way, but you can prune whole uh, import parts, basically. And then the one here at the end just says, yeah, if you 
get anything from X stash tools, just go straight to, to Google. Don't, don't store that locally. Uh, this says pretty much the same thing. Uh, the only thing is that you can also specify a, a checksum DB, which I'll talk about more later on. You can now also have databases of all the checksums of package version of module versions, basically stored somewhere online. So that when you do the initial download, that you can verify that that is the correct one. And here you can, uh, yeah, use your own as well if you. Uh, one of the features, one of the reasons why you would use add-ons, for example, is that um, let's say you have a, a, a private GitLab running and you want to cache those ones. Uh, you don't want to send the information about those to, to some other upstream proxy. And that's what, what, what add-ons let you specify here, like for certain parts, do not go to the upstream proxy, but check those locally. Or if you run your own checksum DB, use that one for those. Right. This is the actual script I used to install Athens. So it's basically just a Docker container. This is for pretty easy. You give some environment variables on how you use it, if you store it on disk or not. Uh, it can run in Kubernetes. Option uh, storage option-wise, it actually got a pretty decent uh, setup. You can do it in, in memory on disk. And, and use S3 or, or Google Cloud Storage. Now it's your storage. Sorry? Now it's your block storage. No, yeah, not yet, exactly. It's quite weird. And now, yeah, it's for the problems with Go Proxy slash Athens. It says mostly with Go Proxy. And the, at the moment, Go Proxy is just one variable. Uh, it's a variable which only has one value. You can set, uh, yeah, you saw the one I set there, I set it to direct or to the proxy. That's, that's the only thing you can do at the moment, which basically means that if any of your packages cannot be found, for example, in, in, in Athens, then it will fail the build. And that, that's a bad thing, <laughs> right? So to fix that, now in Go 1.13, which will be out next month, I pretty much, uh, the first release candidate actually came out today, I think, or yesterday, because I just downloaded it, but I haven't had a chance to try it yet. In there, that environment variable will be um, a comma separated list, which you will try one after the other. And if, if there's a 404 or a 410 for any package, it will try the next one. And the default value will be this here. Uh, sorry, no, the, th this is an example. The default value will be similar. It will be proxy.golang.org, comma direct. So, Google has this big module repository now that they keep in the sky. So by default, you will first go to that one. And if it doesn't find it, then it will go direct. So um, now that can leak your information. Because you're basically, and funnily enough, the, the actual, the, the, the Google proxy module has a, a privacy agreement and things you can look at there so google do keep that data in other words so you, you they've added new environment variables to to avoid you sending all your saying which which kind of internal packages and modules you use to google and that's what the no proxy uh, environment variable is for and there you can put like a almost like a glob pattern <coughs> of packages it it uh, yeah it won't use the, the proxy for. Sorry. Okay. Like I mentioned before, there's this checksum database now as well. It's already up and running. It's, it's, I think it's officially going to be announced with Go 1.13, but you can go there. It's already there. Um, by default, it will be set the uh, you can specify which one, which checksum database you will use. And that's in this GoSumDB environment variable. <coughs> By default, it's set to sum.golang.org. So usually you don't change that one. Um, and go no sum db is one where you can specify for these packages, do not use uh, that one or use, use your own. Uh, 
you can actually go um, that same website if you go to some dot let me show you here This is the website if you go to some.golang.org or if you go to modproxy.golang.org you get here. It doesn't really show you much, it's just a fact about what that's used for. But it does have an API in, at index.golang.org. So you can, let me show you this here. So you can get a, uh, a JSON blobs with all the newest versions that it's, it knows about or and you could even filter like per package i believe so if you want to know if 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 there is a new version of the module you use uh Ask there's a sir? Ask, Ask this index that isn't fully clear <laughs> i think it's just google scraping things because they do mention <coughs> scrape on github pretty much yeah they they have a fact here and they say new versions don't show up immediately try again in an hour or two so that fully suggests that does suggest that they're that they're scraping these things that is what they do yeah and you can file an issue so if you want your own thing to be scraped you just have to tell them i guess all right let me uh, go back But it's, it's still useful, right? So you can see tools or IDs now saying you've got this version of this uh, thing. If there's a newer version, please update. Uh, yeah, go private. I've mentioned that one already. Those are the ones where you don't want to use this. Uh, yeah, the default value for Go proxy will be this here, HTTPS proxy.golang.org and then direct. Use go private to avoid the ones that, are, that you don't want to send to the proxy and you should go direct to set those. It has a privacy policy, I haven't looked at it, but it's Google. They, they want to know everything, right? <laughs> as you know. And now we can actually do the same test again. Uh, given that you've already seen me do it, I've prepared this handy table. Where I did the, the same thing where I basically just do a go mod download on uh, the Athens proxy, clearing it out in between always. And this was on another network connection, so it was pro probably quicker than the one I've got here. And as you can see, um, direct doesn't take too long in this case, but I've heard of something like people who use, um, which was that? so something from Kubernetes, where it can take minutes to download all the dependencies. Um, so in, in those cases, it makes sense to use a proxy, either Athens or proxy.golang itself. For the stuff I'm using here, the proxy.golang seems, right, it makes a difference. It's quick enough. So it's, so that, that's going to be the default value. So that's going to help everybody anyway. Is that um, fourth value that's yeah. sort of half the size of the others? Is that just within the error? Or is yeah, I, I, I don't know. I just tried it. Maybe it, it could have been something here locally caching it uh, or an uh, RISP level or something like that. Yeah. Uh, that I do not know. Yeah. Or Google adding extra capacity after I overwhelmed them in my experiment. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, there are some alternatives as well. Uh, Artifactory, they can, um, they can also work as a module proxy. Uh, we looked at it here, and that's Pitchmatics. Uh, wasn't a fully successful experiment, <laughs> say it that way, but we were using an older version which didn't really support it. We should probably revisit that. The annoying thing with them is that you have to use their tools. So you have to have this wrapper called JFrog RT Go Publish. You have to put that around your Go codes and uh, also the first time you publish anything you need to do a separate command because then it it will know what what are your modules upload them to jfro to artifactory and then when you run this command here again then it will use those modules to build yeah, it, it's 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 slightly more clunky than than just a normal go proxy but then again yeah it's it's, it's a, it has enterprise features right it has access control which 
managers can't live it out apparently. Uh, they also have like a like a public module thing called Go Center. Um, it seems to have less. Uh, edit, last time I checked it out, something like eighty thousand, ninety thousand modules on there. Uh, I think the the Google one probably has more, given given the resources they can put behind it. Uh, and again, similarly here, you have to use a separate binary at the moment called Go C, which is just a wrapper around Go, which first goes to Go Center, and then if it can't find anything, it tries again without thingy. But that will probably be now that uh, that you can have multiple entries in your Go proxy in 1.11. That that probably won't be necessary anymore. They called it Go C because that might be confused with C Go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the conclusions is uh, yeah, this proxy.goline.org is quicker than going to, to the actual uh, version control systems directly, so that's probably a win for everybody. Uh, again, you're sending your data to Google, so if you don't want to do that, make sure you set your Go private or or the go no proxy and go no some DB. Uh, and the fact that we have multiple entries there now means that you always have the direct as a fallback. So things should keep on working as they are. And Athens, uh, I, I use it just on my machine, but given that a lot of our builds are done in Docker, uh, which means you start with a clean environment again. Even local builds are, are done in Docker. And that has helped quite a bit because you, you can see that it's a lot quicker than, than having to go again to the, to the network. Proxy.golang.org running. So they've written their own proxy or do they use the Athens case? I think they've written their own, yeah. Yeah, they don't use Athens. It's Google, right? They do things on their own scale. Uh, one little tidbit I've heard as well is that uh, because semantic versioning is so important apparently somebody at Google is working on a tool that can check whether or not your the current version of your code is still semantically uh, it's compatible with the previous version oh, so where, yeah where you can check whether or not you have breaking changes which of course it can only do for the, the signatures in a sense, right? It can't do for the actual behavior, it can't check that uh, one. But apparently the, the, that's in the works as well. Uh, All right, and that was it. Any questions? Yeah. <laughs> um, you might not have explored this, but for the um, JFrog, um, Artifact reintegration. Yeah. Do you happen to know whether or not they've implemented Jenkins plugins to do the publishing? I don't know. We don't use Jenkins ourselves. Uh, okay. We okay. Don't have no what need what for do that. you use? Just the GitLab uh, CI. Yeah. Because it's built in, right? It's one package version. Yeah. Uh, Great. Thank you. Cool. And we best have, yeah, in our. Uh, GitLab CI.yaml, you have commands like this here at the end, which is, we've, we've, we've got a build engineer, luckily he, he's the one who has to do that and we don't have to touch the JFrag stuff, but, <laughs> and then, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as usual, we're looking for speech speakers, so I'm looking at you now. <laughs> uh, so if, uh, if anybody wants to give a talk, please let us know. Ideas. Would people like to know how to solve Sudoku and go? Yeah. It's a bit yeah. beginnery. Yeah. But it's, it's an interesting well, we can market it like that, right? As a, as a beginner's thing. As a beginner's talk is a, is a good topic. Yeah, I can do that. Yeah. yeah. Cool. I tweeted about it this yesterday. I don't know if you saw that. No. There's a gophers, I forgot what it's called even. Uh, Cam Gopher, possibly. Right. We said that about ages ago. And, uh, I, I remembered just when the email came out from the <laughs> uh, meetup. Oh, you 